now turn to issues around possibilities for the future of the coalition. To talk about the experience and the lessons of Queensland national liberal relations, which culminated in a merger of the two parties in 2008, I'm delighted to introduce the Honourable Rob Borbidge, who served as the 35th Premier of Queensland from 1996 to 1998. Rob was the leader of the Queensland Nationals and was the last member of that party to serve as Premier. In 1980, Mr. Borbidge contested and won the seat of Surface Paradise from the sitting Liberal member and served in a number of ministerial positions in the National Party government. The loss of that government to Wayne Goss's Labor Party in 1989, after 32 years in government, meant rebuilding the non-Labor coalition which narrowly won office in 1996 when he became Premier. Mr. Borbidge faced the full electoral threat of the One Nation Party and in 1998, a minority Labor government took the reins. A very complicated political picture from Queensland during that time, especially, but still perhaps. Uh, Mr. Borbidge, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, the screen is yours, we're looking forward to it. Thanks very much, David, and thank you for the opportunity of uh, addressing the delegates today. I, I guess by, by way of background, uh, a little bit of history, and I, I think we, we all know that Queensland is, is different and uh, very often difficult in terms of the federal political landscape. But the merger in Queensland came about as a result of the uh, acceptance by people in both the National Party and the Liberal Party that the long-term animosity uh, between uh, the two Conservative parties simply had to be addressed. Uh, there was a long-standing view uh, in Queensland amongst Liberals that uh, they should be the major Conservative Party and that they were being held back by the uh, uh, so-called gerrymander during the Joe years. And it was really uh, post the Fitzgerald inquiry and the uh, redistribution which occurred prior to the 1992 election that sorted that out. Uh, there were uh, effectively some five National Party seats abolished in that redistribution, uh, but the National Party managed to win four new seats. Uh, the Liberal Party sort of plotted along. Uh, so uh, there was an acceptance then under effective one vote, one value uh, that the Nationals had retained their majority status, notwithstanding the fact that it was always going to be a demographic challenge uh, for the Nationals to hold new seats that were being created in places like uh, the Gold Coast and the Sunshine Coast and uh, some of the regional centres. So it was designed to be a solution. There was a, a failed attempt at merger uh, post the uh, 92 election and uh, for various reasons it didn't proceed at that stage but uh, a coalition agreement was entered into which resulted in uh, the minority government being elected uh, in a baton change of government uh, after the 1995 election where some uh, 20 seats were won off then the GOSS Labor government. I think it's uh, significant to, to, to point out that uh, the merger wasn't a takeover. It, it, it really effectively was a meeting of the minds. It was a realisation from both parties uh, that the only way to, to win government in Queensland, particularly under the optional preferential system uh, that Labor had put in place, was if there were going to be no three-cornered contests and that effectively if the parties could pool their resources. So it, 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 was, it came about as a state-based objective. The, the great irony is uh, that at a state level, it hasn't worked near as well as it's worked at a federal level. In fact, uh, the merger, uh, the LNP merger in Queensland has uh, helped uh, the Liberal and National Parties in Queensland uh, secure government on the last two general elections. Uh, so, you know, it's been it's been interesting that the problem it was designed to solve, it hasn't fixed, uh, but the problem of working together at a federal level uh, has certainly been one of the major beneficiaries. 
Uh, why hasn't it worked at a state level? Uh, and what are the problems? Uh, I guess anyone who's reading the press at the moment knows that there's a fair degree of dislocation uh, between the uh, parliamentary party and the LNP organisation in Queensland. I think it's important to, to point out that the differences that have occurred are not national versus liberal. They're not moderate versus conservative. They're not city versus country. Uh, the differences that have occurred and have restricted the ability of the LNP uh, to be more successful in Queensland have basically been personality driven. And uh, I think that's significant. Uh, we have a, a situation where uh, really the factionalism that was a problem uh, in the Liberal Party in Queensland uh, has largely disappeared. Uh, there are some personality issues at organisational level, but I think if you look at the parliamentary party in Queensland and you try and identify uh, who's a Nat and who's a Lib, um, you, you'd find it very difficult. The, the parliamentary parties at state level have worked very closely together and of course uh, under that agreement, which is very much based on the CLP model, uh, the seats are grandfathered and uh, those members that go to Canberra uh, can determine or it is determined whether they sit in the Liberal Party or the National Party room. Uh, will there be a demerger in Queensland? Uh, my view very firmly, it's uh, simply too difficult to unscramble the egg. Federally it works. Uh, there's no reason why it can't work at a state level. It elected the Campbell Newman government with the biggest parliamentary majority in Australian political history, uh, which resulted three years later in the biggest parliamentary loss uh, in Australian political history. But I think that that demonstrates that the formula is basically right. Uh, the, the degree of cooperation between the, the, the two former parties in the new entity is strong. And uh, where there is appropriate uh, direction, and uh, I, I think the significant thing is that the success in the federal campaigns uh, in large part comes down to the fact that uh, they have been coordinated at a federal level and the LNP in Queensland has effectively been the, the service delivery agent on the ground, uh, demonstrates that the model itself uh, has been and can be successful. Um, What's to be learnt from the whole exercise? I guess there's nothing new um, in terms of the experience in Queensland compared to, uh, to other states. The members of parliament and the organisation must be close-knit and must work closely together. And uh, part of the, the challenge at the present time in Queensland is that there's a bit of a, well, very much a, an us versus them attitude uh, between the uh, executive of the organisation and the parliamentary party. Uh, this is something that I think is going to right itself. Uh, um, these, you know, the, the great, great advantage of the LNP model is that uh, at the end of the day, uh, post COVID, when there can be a convention, uh, it is a, a great grassroots uh, political machine. And uh, uh, come the day, the grassroots membership, I'm sure, will rise to the occasion and overcome any difficulties that have been experienced or are being experienced at the present time. So the lessons from the merger and the lessons pre-merger is that the MPs and the organisations must be close-knit. They must work closely together. The party must listen to its grassroots. Uh, we have to be careful in any political party uh, where you have uh, particularly at organisational level, uh, the organisational equivalent of a kitchen cabinet. And uh, that becomes a particular issue, uh, as we've seen in recent times, uh, with the advent of COVID and the, the ability of the grassroots membership of the party to come together en masse. I think it's very important to be humble in government. If there was a, a lesson out of the Campbell Newman experience, uh, that uh, phenomenal victory followed by that colossal defeat is that governments do need to be humble. Um, you know, when you get elected and you, you have the, the great privilege of serving 
uh, on the coalition benches. Uh, there's so much goodwill, uh, but inevitably uh, you have to use up that goodwill on the fights that matter, not the fights that don't. And uh, if you start looking to get into every scrap that you can, whether it's within a coalition, within the broader framework of a, a unified political party, or as an LNP in government, taking on various sectional interests in the community, uh, you have to be very careful because people will only stomach so much of it. And at the end of the day, politics is the art of the achievable. And you don't want to be using up that goodwill on the fights that really don't matter much when there are going to be plenty of battles ahead, uh, when the requirement will be there to galvanise public opinion and party opinion to achieve something substantial uh, in terms of a legacy of government. Uh, the other interesting element, uh, and I think that it's something that, that has to be watched uh, on the conservative side of politics, it's certainly a lesson out of Queensland, is that um, uh, the big end of town, unfortunately, has by and large an appalling grasp of politics. Uh, and we need the big end of town. Uh, we, we need their support. Uh, we need their financial backing. Uh, but very often uh, what uh, major corporations and business leaders advocate uh, governments should do uh, whilst desirable in some instances uh, are simply unachievable and in some instances what they advocate is simply not desirable at all. So I think that it gets back to uh, uh, to, to quote John Howard's uh, long-standing view about the Liberal Party, the need to be a broad church, uh, the need to encompass people beyond those that attend branch meetings, beyond those that attend conventions because they're the people that uh, ultimately determine the outcome of an election and uh, elections in Australia historically are, are always won in the centre and if uh, the centre right goes too far to the right then that ends in tears and if the uh, the centre left goes too far to the left uh, the same thing happens. So I, I guess in summary uh, the, the merger in Queensland is here to stay. Yes there are lessons, uh, it can work it's important to have uh, clearly the, the right people in the right positions, but that's uh, something that's a constant in politics anyway. Uh, will it happen in other states or should it happen in other states? Look, that's something that varies across the nation. I mean, if you look historically at the uh, Liberal Party and the National Party in New South Wales, uh, there was never the, the animosity that existed in Queensland that simply had to be put to bed for the common good. And I give as an example in, in the 1992 uh, general election in Queensland, the first on the post Fitzgerald boundaries. Uh, prior, uh, prior to that uh, coalition being reformed post 1992, as opposition leader and leader of the National Party, in my seat, I ended up with a Liberal MP from another Gold Coast seat not contesting his seat and coming to oppose me in my seat. And that demonstrates just how entrenched uh, the feelings were for various reasons, obviously faults on both sides. But that was the, the genesis of sensible people in both parties saying, hey, this is crazy. It simply cannot continue. So um, I think I might leave it at that. That's uh, uh, life as I see it, uh, but, but clearly um, if anyone has any questions, I'd be delighted to try and answer them. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, we, we do have a few questions, but in, first, may I take you back to 2008, that year of, of, um, of the merger. Um, you, you've spoken a, a, at least a couple of times in your presentation about the organisation and I, I expect not just for candidates and for rusted on supporters, but especially for the organisations that were involved in the merger, it must have been an extremely difficult time for them. There would, of course, well, there would, I assume, be fewer positions for organisational types to, to fill. Um, it, was that the case? What, what, what was the view of the organisation in bringing this merger together? 
Look, there was a, a lot of foresight. Um, the people that that steered it through and uh, Lawrence Springborg, who was the National Party leader at the time uh, in the parliament and, and Mark McArdle, the, the Liberal Party leader, had uh, strong support from their respective presidents. And uh, these these issues, quite frankly, were, were overcome. I mean, there was a general acceptance that it's not much fun being in opposition. Uh, the name of the game is to get into government and do things. And if, uh, if there weren't as many positions, well, um, you know, so be it. Uh, it was just an overwhelming, almost a feeling of desperation that, that this had to happen to fix a problem. Uh, fair enough. Um, the uh, I'm a little surprised at that because um, people do tend to like to hang on to their to their positions and their uh, their credit cards. But nevertheless, um, let, let me push on. Um, you've you made the point, I think, in some ways that personalities have been the downfall of the of the Queensland um, LNP. Um, you mentioned Campbell Newman and um, and the, the problems with um, hubris, I think. Um, is the issue with personalities that the party is not selecting the right sorts of people, the right sorts of people aren't presenting themselves for, for, for candidate, candidacies? Yeah, look, a, a couple of things, and I don't want to be over, overly critical of, of Campbell because he, he achieved a great deal in a, a relatively short period of time. Uh, it would have been better if he'd achieved a great deal in a, a longer period of time, but, uh, you know, that, that wasn't to be. And we had the unusual situation where uh, Campbell was parachuted into Parliament uh, from being Lord Mayor of, of Brisbane and... No, I think to be fair, had not had that uh, tradition of how the parliament operates and, and all the rest of it, and that led to some some difficulties in process. But I mean, having said that, uh, the Newman government uh, had some very substantial achievements. Candidate selection um, is is very important, uh, but uh, we've had some outstanding candidates. I mean, we had some great great candidates in this recent election in Queensland. And, you know, the, the, the great irony is and a couple of people that I know that are, are senior ministers uh, in, the, in the current uh, Labor government in Queensland would, would probably deny it. But a couple of them have said to me that uh, pre-COVID uh, Labor in Queensland were cooked. You know, they, 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 they were in, in deep trouble. Uh, and the LNP had some outstanding candidates, but at the end of the day was just out campaigned on the ground by a, a smarter campaign, uh, a campaign that was more responsive uh, and a, a campaign that was just streets ahead of what the LNP could run. And of course, greatly assisted by um, the, the COVID outbreak and the, the perception, particularly amongst uh, older Queenslanders that uh, uh, the Queensland Premier uh, was basically saving their lives in terms of the policies that have been implemented and the border closures and all the rest of it. Uh -huh. Well, Joel Fitzgibbon, who preceded you in the conference, uh, talked about the abilities of a leader, including the notion of luck. Um, and I think that for almost all incumbents currently, uh, going, having been through the COVID experience, uh, there, there is a very big advantage to incumbency. So that there is an element of Bad luck in uh, in the timing of the of the most recent Queensland election, I suspect. Oh, for sure. I mean, you can do everything right, and if it's the the wrong time, uh, you're in trouble. And there's no doubt about that at all. Mm. But uh, that's uh, that's politics. So you pick yourself up and uh, try again. <laughs> you very diplomatically compared. Well, you very diplomatically didn't compare Queensland with other states and. Uh, the, the states of uh, the, the relationships between non-Labor parties in those states. We, we all understand that Queensland is different in a number of important ways. It's the most decentralised of, of all the Australian states. Uh, it's, a, it's a unicameral parliament, for example. There are a range of things. It's the weather is great as well as everything else. Um, but um, would you hazard a, a view about uh, Merges between, let's say, the federal uh, Liberal and National parties. I, th I think it is, I think you're conceding effectively that there's no real philosophical difference that would would prevent such a such a merger. 
there may be practical sorts of difficulties, but um, how would you respond to that? Yeah, well, I guess the, the, the argument against a merger at federal level in particular is that there may well be people that um, would vote national that may not vote liberal and, and vice versa. And I guess a, a good example playing out at the moment is that uh, the number of uh, coal mining seats that the LNP won that you know basically sit in the National Party camp in Canberra now. Oh. Um, and I know this is a, an issue in the Labor Party as well in, in how it's handled uh, in seats like Hunter and what Joel Fitzgibbons uh, going through at the present time uh, versus, if you like, the the battle for the inner urban seats uh, and the, the liberal priorities there. So, you know, these issues bounce up regularly. And I think at a federal level, they're an argument uh, against uh, merger. And, and the other point is that relations between the Liberal Party and the National Party federally are very strong. Uh, they're good in New South Wales. In Queensland, they were broken. And and, and that's that's the big difference. Yeah. So so I'm getting the message that if it's if it's not broke, don't fix it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could you reflect a little on um, one of our early contributors, Dr. Gazarian, talked about the fracturing of the conservative vote in Australia, by which he meant in part the emergence of groups like uh, Pauline Hanson's One Nation and so on. Um, some of these groups are Queensland origin, not necessarily confined to Queensland, but, but grew up in Queensland. Can you say something about the temper of the Queensland electorate that would um, turn against its uh, turn against conservative politics or become ultra conservative in some respects yeah look it's always been a, a trait in Queensland and it's it's always been a challenge and if you go back to the Joe years uh, you know old Joe managed them uh, he he humored these people he didn't really do much you know except uh, make them feel as if they were were listened to I mean it didn't greatly alter his agenda or the agenda of the then National Party. And I guess he had this cult following as a result of uh, his efforts to, to bring down the, the Whitlam government and then the abolition of death duties, which contributed to a you know, massive interstate migration to Queensland, which forced the issue of the abolition of death duties across Australia. So so that, that era, uh, if you like, uh, the people on the fringes, uh, Joe was able to to mop up between in the in the main body politic. Uh, the challenge came later uh, with issues like native title and national competition policy and and gun laws in particular. Uh, I mean, these people have always been there, uh, whether they have been on the fringes of the major political parties, whether they've been independents, whether they've been one nation, whether they've been Clive Palmer or there'll be someone else next year. Uh, but what has been, what was a, a major issue and a major problem in Queensland was that with optional preferential voting, uh, a lot of these fringe dwellers on the conservative side would vote one and that was it. And the indirect beneficiary would then be uh, the Labor Party. Um, that, uh, um, you know, changed with preferential voting being reintroduced in Queensland, but one of the one of the uh, interesting aspects of the recent state election in Queensland, which I, I think is something for other states and other jurisdictions to watch out for, is that um, these particular groups, uh, where they there was an expectation the One Nation vote would collapse, but the expectation was that it would probably the LNP 40% to Labor. It, it, it overwhelmingly went to Labor uh, in the last election. So we, we can't assume that those fringe dwellers will uh, automatically come back to the Conservatives. One of the, um, one of the barometers of the, of the relations between uh, the National and the Liberal parties in Queensland prior to uh, the merger um, is perhaps indicated by your own entry into Parliament. In other words, by what are called three-cornered contests and also by your departure from, from the Queensland Parliament. Um, 
<laughs> can you do, do you see this as just destructive? Uh, we, we talked before, Professor Goot earlier today talked about three three corner contests. W were they destructive of the non labour vote in, in Queensland? Oh, overwhelmingly so. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know there's, there's the argument that one party will pick up what the other party can't, but, you know, and there may be the odd seat where a three corner contest will work. But it just portrays the uh, impression of disunity. It really cheeses off uh, people that we need to uh, make donations to. Uh, it provides uh, ammunition uh, for the for the Labor Party because it uh, uh, creates quite rightly uh, the impression of division. Uh, three cornered contests, uh, in my view, are incredibly destructive. Well. Mr. Borbich, uh, thanks so much for joining us. I, I realise you've had some difficulties with, with connectivity, as they say, in your hotel room, and uh, but you've come through it, to me at least, loud and clear, I hope also to, to all our delegates. Uh, but I really thank you for your time today. It's, it's been a great contribution to our, to our conference. Thanks very much. Been a pleasure thank to join you. Thank you.